Imagine you're enjoying a moment of rest in your humble dwelling when suddenly you hear a knock on the door. Upon opening it, you notice a man with an ax. Is your grandma home? He asks. Two things will probably go through your mind in this scenario. What does this guy want from my grandma? And what do I answer? She does happen to be there, but will you tell him that? Well, according to Immanuel Kant, you will. Kant believed that universal law should be followed in such a situation. In this case, the law is you should never lie. This is called the categorical imperative. Suppose you don't like Kant that much. So you tell the ax murderer she isn't there. Your grandma, who got awfully scared as soon as she heard the door open, decided to escape through the back door. Now, the ax murderer turned down, returning to his car, is met with your grandma, trying to get away. Consequently, not only has grandma been killed, but you contributed to her death directly by telling a lie. If you had told the truth instead, even if she had been killed, it wouldn't be your fault. And she still would have had the chance to escape. Now, you might ask, how likely is that to happen? Not very. And in addition to that, lying can get so much more complex. Countless philosophers throughout the history of mankind have tackled the question of how humans lie. They came to a myriad of conclusions, so many in fact, they're beyond our comprehension. That is why I endorse a different approach. That the paramount step in surviving in a world built of lies is acknowledging we, or 60% of you in the audience, lie from two to three times for every 10 minutes of conversation time, which is so much more than we'd like to admit. Firstly, I'd like to unpack what a lie actually is. The definition of deception, or in other words, a lie, is a psychological process by which one individual deliberately attempts to convince another person to accept as true what the liar knows to be false, typically for the liar, or sometimes for others, to gain some type of benefit or to avoid loss. But what more can be said about how our brains come up with lies? Multiple cognitive processes can be associated with deception. Hence, it can be deducted that a holistic interaction between certain areas of the brain is necessary for us to come up with a lie. In this case, it is the cooperation between the prefrontal cortex and specific subcortical areas. The involvement of the anterior prefrontal cortex was proven to play a pivotal role in deception, for instance, by the researchers from the University of Tübingen, who applied direct transcranial current simulation to 44 volunteers. The volunteers were then involved in a role play where they pretended to steal money to then attend an interrogation. When the subject's prefrontal cortex was inhibited, they were able to come up with lies much faster and more skillfully. Apart from that, other subcortical areas were also researched to play a role in deception, such as, for instance, the ventral striatum that is known for playing a role in uh, calculating gaining benefit or loss avoidance. Last but not least, the amygdala deserves a mention. The amygdala was proved to play a role in deception by a story seemingly straight out of a fairy tale. So, in the early 1990, a man in his 50s was diagnosed with a strange form of epilepsy. It was a reflex epilepsy that characterized by seizures that rooted in the man's sensitivity to environmental stimulants. The man was a big fish working in the economic European community, and he experienced a seizure each time he told a business-related lie. An MRI revealed that the seizure stemmed from a menagnoma that was 13 millimeters in diameter and compressed his amygdala. This uh, proves not only how the amygdala influences the process of deception, but also highlights how prominent lies are in professional environments. Each time the man tried to tell the whitest of lies, the truth was handed to his opponents on a platter. And bending the truth was so crucial for the man's career that he was able to go back to his duties only when the menignoma was removed, when the seizure stopped. The Pinocchio syndrome really draws our attention to the fact that deception is a truly characteristic trait for humans. And oftentimes, 
cutting out lies from our lives would be simply impossible. Moreover, deception can also be found in other areas of our lives, such as socializing with others, bringing up children, or politics. If we're talking about liars that really take it to the extreme, whose whole careers are based on deception, we ought to bring up politicians. And for politicians who were exposed for lying during the span of their careers, Donald Trump is a perfect example. He was allegedly found to have made 10,796 misleading claims over 876 days of his career, which sets him at an astounding rate of 15 lies daily in 2018. This can only prove that sometimes truth is not the most important virtue that we seek as humans, especially considering the fact that some of his lies were as blatant as America is the highest tax country in the world. Now, we can be sure that deception makes a useful cognitive tool, but can it be applied ethically, especially in politics? Machiavelli proposed an answer to that question in chapter 18 of The Subtle Art of Lying. According to Machiavelli, sometimes the ruler simply shouldn't keep his word to the people, especially when it is not in his best interest. Not only that, he believed that having qualities like honesty, sympathy, or compassion is not necessary for a leader as long as he appears to possess them. Machiavelli uh, believed that deception was a tool that could be used for maintaining a well-composed society. He said, men judge generally more by the eye than by the hand because it belongs to everyone to see you, to few to come in touch with you. Everybody sees what you appear to be. Few really know what you are, and those few do not oppose themselves to the opinion of the many who have the majesty of the state to defend them. So following his train of thought and playing the devil, so in this case Machiavelli's advocate, can we even blame politicians for using the power of the truth that they hold to their advantage? Lying is rooted in our conscience. And at the same time, it establishes an extraordinary achievement of evolution, proving the immense capability of our brains. Most children begin to lie at about three years old when they start to understand that their mental states may differ from the mental states of others and that what they know might not be known to others. This is called developing a so-called theory of mind. This process proves that we are naturally, as humans, inclined to lie, and we assimilate lying completely naturally throughout us growing up. Not only that, many researchers consider the ability to tell a lie proof that a child's cognitive processes have matured. Lying has only been found uh, to exist in mammals with complex social interactions and higher intelligence. This can only prove that lying makes us human. Nietzsche, in one of his least famous works on truth and lie in an extra moral sense, dwells upon the trivial role that humanity plays in the immeasurable vastness of the universe. He uncovers that nature too has concealed the most truth from us, even regarding our own bodies. And in this world, filled with deception, where would an urge for truth originate. It is explained that we seek truth to maintain societal existence, but with this social existence based on language that consists of overlapping metaphors, how can anything be considered true? Nietzsche supports a common saying that a lie told often enough becomes truth. On a different note, this quote is attributed to Lenin. Anyway, Nietzsche claims that every concept that we consider true that we came up with has arisen from an equation of unequal things. In one of my favorite quotes, Nietzsche claims that every concept that we express with speech is a metaphor, as if everything that we said had a subjective, hence deceptive, element. Nietzsche stated, expressing these relations, he, men, lays hold of the boldest metaphors. To begin with, a nerve stimulus is transferred into an image. First metaphor, the image in turn is imitated in a sound, second metaphor. And each time there is a complete overleaping of one sphere right into the middle of an entirely new and different one. One can imagine a man who is totally deaf and has never had any sensation of sound and music. Perhaps 
such a person will gaze with astonishment at Claudini's sound figures. Perhaps he will discover their cause in the vibrations of the string and will now swear that he must know what men mean by sound. It is this way with all of us concerning language. We believe that we know something about the things themselves when we speak of trees, colors, snow and flowers. And yet we possess nothing but metaphors for things. Metaphors which correspond in no way to the original entities. So, to conclude, in my opinion, to survive in this world built of lies, there is nothing more we can do than try to understand what humanity has never understood.